Gila Mahagut, Egalir, Tamana Buik Vetansha, and you, is Anor Mordum, Lalinda Blinta, a V Hart, Visek Fake, and there, and Disport, and Show, August a Kamad, Sul, a Gaklo de Vig, Titamamak. I just want to thank the opportunity to be here. I think it's very, very important that we have an opportunity like this. I'm a newly elected TD uh, 16 months ago, and one of my major experiences so far has been that the, uh, the work of a TD is expected to keep up with the media cycle, and the media cycle is accelerating currently, and therefore the, the heat of the spotlight flits from one issue to another uh, very, very quickly, which leaves it difficult to stick with one issue. And it's the sticking with one issue, and the working with one issue over the medium and long term is more likely to resolve the issue. And so therefore, getting an opportunity to think things through, discuss and listen uh, at a summer school like this is extremely important. As has been said, I'm the first Sinn Féin TD in Meath since Lee Meadows was elected in 1918, and it's a massive honor for myself uh, to be there. And Mellows was a Republican giant, and in many ways his ideas have a certain gravity that still bring you into uh, his thoughts. And um, Liam Mellows, I suppose, was of the view that the state needs to be loyal to the citizens. And at that time, his view was that uh, as an elected TD, he shouldn't sit in Westminster, and he should sit uh, not in that state, but here, and create a state for Irish people. Obviously, that uh, right was denied to him by the English government at the time. And that republicanism, the republicanism that I espouse, is a whole idea of government for the people of Ireland, by the people of Ireland, and of the people of Ireland. And these views have been you know, uh, articulated by you know, going back as far as United Irishmen, Fenians, volunteers. They were nailed onto the walls of the, the GPO, uh, Lakesh and Armagh jail. And I suppose sometimes in this modern period, the views of those Republicans might sound a little bit naive or even trite, um, but their view was that the public interest, the interest of the individuals was central and that the state should be built around those people. And on this topic that we're here today, that of the governance of society, for me, I suppose, the governance structures don't sit in isolation. They sit very much on the foundation of the people they serve and within the prevailing political culture. And I believe that the prevailing political culture um, creates and influences those structures, and those structures create and influence the prevailing political culture, that both of them are actually interdependent. And, you know, a culture, a political culture at odds with the structures within a state uh, will have a, 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 a negative effect because they'll work against each other. And it's often said that the anti-establishment political culture in Ireland came from the colonial past within the state. In other words, the state was a British state, so therefore I owe no loyalty to it, so I am anti-establishment and anti that state. So there's a, a kind of a symbiotic relationship going on between political culture and the structures within a, a particular society. I also believe, with regards to political structures and governance structures, that decisions need to be made as close to the people that they affect as possible. And that when you remove decisions to an, a higher level away from those people, it disempowers the individuals, it reduces the quality of the decisions, and also it has the effect of reducing accountability. Because the people who suffer the effect of a decision cannot, because the structures are not there, hold the decision makers accountable. And it's one of the reasons why I see creeping EU federalism uh, as a danger to uh, good governance structures. Because again and again, the decision making process is removed directly from the people that it affects. And therefore, it doesn't nurture that uh, culture of accountability and that culture of empowerment. There's a large number of influences to political cultures uh, on which the governance structures sit. And I just want to mention a couple of them, if I can, for your thinking. Um, the issue of capital is very, very important with regards uh, being an influencer. Now, 
I'm not against capital having an influence on the debate. And indeed, I'm the spokesperson for enterprise, jobs and innovation for my party. And on a daily basis, I make representations for small and medium-sized enterprises. And I'm proud to do so. But I suppose those um, representations always need to be tempered, that the citizens' rights come first. Uh, and sometimes when that hierarchy of priority is confused or is, is, is not properly aligned, it can cause major dif difficulties to the political culture within the state. And on a micro level, when capital has a, a stronger influence than citizens, it can create, I believe, uh, on a micro level, it can, it can create corruption. But on a macro level, it can cause massive problems. And in my, my particular view would be that the fact that this state has been completely reorientated to become a debt repayment agency for private banking shows that the interests of private capital have superseded uh, in political culture terms, the interests of the citizens. Um, and just, you know, in notes that were, were smuggled out of jail uh, in 1922, Lee Mellows stated prophetically, Ireland does not want a change of master. It would be folly to destroy English tyranny in order to erect a domestic tyranny that would need another revolution to free the people. The Irish Republic stands, therefore, for the ownership of Ireland by the people of Ireland, it means that the means and the processes of productions must not be used for the self-aggrandizement of any group or class. And it's, you know, what he goes on to say is actually frightening. Ireland, if our industries and our banks are controlled by foreign capital, would be at the mercy of every breeze that ruffles the surface of the world's money markets. And today, as we see, uh, the international structures and governance structures and how they have uh, been created is leading to every democracy now is at the whim of uh, those international uh, world money markets that Mello speaks of. Another very important influencer in, in, of political culture on which governance is based, in my perspective, is media. And today in Ireland, we're, we're blessed that we have some very, very strong good media organizations. I believe that the force of the state, as I call it, is really central to a good functioning uh, culture. But in general terms, in my view, the media as it's structured in Ireland is an oligopoly. In other words, there are few, a number, a small amount of large players within the particular market. And those players are often ultra wealthy uh, business people on one hand, and on the other hand, large British media organizations. And then you have a smaller section, which is indigenous uh, Irish smaller media organizations. And the danger of, of an oligopoly is it can leave media in the hands of a number of small, very wealthy business people who can actually cr uh, create or set the agenda within a state. And the Leveson Inquiry in Britain illustrated the awesome power that uh, a self, I suppose, serving uh, media mogul had on the British uh, political culture and on the governance structures. And even when you see the likes of uh, you know, Margaret Thatcher to Tony Blair literally being scared to put their heads against, up against the power pit with these media organizations in case it would meet the end of their political agendas. I think a, a healthier culture would be one that is served by what they call in economics a perfect competition. So you have an, a large number of smaller media organizations creating a diversity of thought and strong competition uh, and therefore you know, making sure that individuals didn't have an excessive influence over the, the democratic debate within a state. I think another influencer of that political culture, uh, which is often overlooked, uh, especially in the 26 counties, is the border. And I mean it like this, when Liam Mellows and other Republicans of his time were discussing the treaty, they came to the view that if the border was enacted, that two establishments would grow on both sides of the border. And, you know, he felt that in the South there would be a, maybe the political establishment in the South would uh, communicate an anemic pro-unity um, message. But in reality, they would realize that the border itself would defend 
their establishments. So in other words, if you got rid of the, 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 the border, their political power will be diluted by a new political dynamic that will be created in the state. And so therefore, the border itself has led to some of the structures that we see in this state. And for me, it has reduced diversity. It has uh, created what I would call a, a faux factionalism between Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael. And it doesn't allow for the, the breadth and depth of debate that would happen on this island if it were functioning on a 32 county basis. The debate on reforming the fundamental structures is, is very, very important. But we don't realize it. At this current ju juncture of the state, the future is not set in stone. There is a fluidity to the governance of this state that has been generated out of the Good Friday Agreement and the St. Andrews Agreement. In the north, we have institutions based on power sharing um, that are dependent on the functioning of all Ireland's bodies. Institutions underpinned by equality legislation, um, important constitutional position is no longer fixed. Right now, we have a situation in the state that we have a blank canvas where this generation can actually uh, imbue its own vision on what the future should hold onto that blank canvas and create the, uh, the structures that should govern Ireland into the future. Now, I suppose it's my political uh, job as a, as a Republican to create the opportunity for that to happen and to create an agenda, I suppose, a willingness and an optimism a hunger within society to actually step up to the plate and say, this is a defining generation. This is a generation that can actually make this significant change with regards to development of the country. Um, the upcoming Constitutional Convention can offer, in, in my opinion, great opportunity. It is, though, shows a lack of um, confidence. It shows a lack of ambition. Um, it's a situation where you know, a decision governing 17-year-olds won't have 17-year-olds represented on it is a, a major difficulty. That individuals are selected from the, the registrar when the registrar in itself is not reflective of society uh, creates a major difficulty as well. And the level of funding and the issues to be discussed uh, show an enormous lack of ambition by this state. I'm also uh, not confident that the government mean business by it. Um, a, a number of, of, of months ago, I was selected to be the Cahirlach of a new Investigations, Oversight and Petitions Committee within the state, uh, within the Houses of the Oireachtas. And in the Programme for Governments, the governments indicated that they want this to be a very powerful organisation that would hold people to account. And accountability is central to good governance. And um, in, they even had a referendum held last uh, October in an, effort, in an effort to go beyond the Constitution to gain powers for Oireachtas Committee's investigations. But since that committee, uh, or that referendum was lost, um, the, the government has sent us away to do the studies on it. We've held dozens of, of meetings of that committee in an effort to uh, find out what the issues were. We identified a, a, a set of powers, the most important to look for uh, and to compel people, papers and records. When, we, when it was an all-party committee, uh, which sent this request for the standing orders to be agreed to the government, and the government refused those powers, which are already within the Constitution, and only allowed for the compelability on papers, peoples, and records to be allowed on the oversight of uh, the Ombudsman. And for me, that showed, I suppose, a, a government you know, deciding to do something and then stepping back from that which is, a, a, which is a, a major disappointment. However, we hope, I suppose, in the, in the next years to reapply for standing orders, which will be greatly uh, uh, strengthened and to allow for that account accountability uh, to be de developed. I suppose the, the point I'll just leave you with here is that, as I said earlier, that symbiotic relationship between the citizens, citizenry, and the culture of the citizen, citizenry and the uh, state is helped by an empowered uh, citizen body and in my perspective over the last number of years uh, I haven't I've seen a disempowered citizen body and I think what we need to do as uh, political activists in my view is to empower that group of people that means keeping decision-making in, in their hands with regards to local governments that 
you know, we don't take local government out of their hands and make decisions further away. And that we also make sure that good human rights are, are, are at the heart of our state. And the Good Friday Agreement allows for an All-Ireland uh, Civil Rights Charter to be developed. And I believe that would be one of the steps to create the political culture which will lead to better political governance. Gormila Magath, Accordion.